Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. If you are a student attending this morning's lecture for credit in a business speaking, management speaking, or corporate communication course, please be certain to send me an email documenting your presence. Let's meet this morning's speaker. Elizabeth Allen is an experienced multi-industry communications and marketing branding executive with Fortune 100, growing Fortune 500 companies, and not-for-profit healthcare organizations. Her special expertise is with CEOs who were game changers in their industries or who wanted to significantly transform market position and perception. Currently, Ms. Allen is responsible for all marketing, communications, government relations, and community and public engagement activities for the Metro Health System, Cuyahoga County's essential public hospital system. She also leads Metro Health's move into concierge medicine and co-leads its strategic plan. Metro Health is Cleveland's only certified level one trauma center for adults, the only certified burn center for adults and children, and the only Ebola treatment center in Ohio. Prior to Metro Health, Ms. Allen was a member of the Executive Management Committee and Chief Communication Officer for Huntington Bank, a regional bank headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Her responsibilities encompassed all internal and external communications, government relations, and customer communication. Previously, she held Chief Communication Officer positions at Dell, Staples, Two defense companies, Raytheon and Laurel, now part of Lockheed Martin, and Premier Health Partners. She serves on Northwestern University's Medill School Board of Advisors and was an original inductee into its Hall of Achievement. She's a frequent lecturer on crisis and corporate communication and has served as an adjunct professor at Northwestern, George Washington University, and the University of Texas. She is also a charter member of Notre Dame's Conference on Corporate Communication. Ms. Allen earned her bachelor's degree in journalism from Northwestern University and an MBA from Indiana University. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome back to Notre Dame, Elizabeth Heller Allen. Thank you and good morning. I love to come to Notre Dame and I, it always used to irritate me when I was younger uh, when people would say, oh, I've known him for 20 years. Jim and I have known each other for at least 20 years and I will say there is nobody in the corporate communications industry who so tirelessly supports other people. If you ever have a question, if you have a problem, Jim O'Rourke is the guy who will help you out. He has mentored more students and more professionals than anybody I know in the industry, and I've been there a while. So he is a very special person to me, and Notre Dame is a special uh, place for me. What Jim said in the nicest possible Jim O'Rourke way is that I am not a healthcare expert. I have worked in lots of different industries but not necessarily that long in healthcare. So what you will get today is a combination of my opinions as somebody who's worked for hyper-competitive retail industries like Dell and Staples. My opinion about healthcare is a little bit different than somebody who has spent most of their career in healthcare. One of the interesting things about healthcare is that many of you in your career will work for consulting firms or you will go from company to company and industry to industry. Most people in healthcare stay in healthcare so that they don't have a good sense of the way that the rest of, uh, the, rest of the world works. So you'll get a lot of opinions from me and the PowerPoint slides have facts. I have opinions and I will try to uh, uh, pull them together. What I'd really like to do is to give you not so much facts, because the minute you start talking about healthcare, you just get overwhelmed by how incre incredibly complicated and opaque it is, partly on purpose, because people don't mess with you if they don't understand you. Um, but it's more to give you things to talk about. So if we're talking about healthcare 10 years from now, I have no better idea what it's going to be like than any of these political pundits on TV. Part of it is going to be who gets elected this November. You've got some candidates who believe that the government has no place in health care. The government 
spending too much money on health care, and that it is that the amount of government spending and commitment to health care is not appropriate. You've got other people who believe essentially in a single payer model, which means that the government pays for everybody's health care. So you've got two diametrically opposed uh, ways to look at the world. And for those of you who follow politics, you know that the current Congress has attempted over 40 or 50 times to get rid of Obamacare in one way or another. So whether Obamacare goes or stays, and how it changes, or if it shuts down, has a huge impact on what the healthcare industry is going to look like in 10 years. Um, one of the things that, that it didn't strike me until I started working in a hospital, what makes healthcare special is A, it's a little insular, but B, when you think about who your customers are, your customers come to you for something that they want. Think about healthcare. Everybody who walks into one of our facilities doesn't want to be there. They're sick. They're grumpy. They're scared. They're not so sure how they're going to pay for things or even how much those things are going to cost. So you have a, a, a customer experience paradigm, which is a fair amount uh, different. The other thing about healthcare today is that it is one of the few industries left on the planet when you don't know what the price is and you don't know what the cost is. Think about an industry that operates that way. Um, and also, healthcare has by and large been protected from uh, competitive forces. All industries, most industries, are increasingly competitive. And you can see them making small and large moves in order to change their service or their product offering or something to be more competitive. Healthcare is not like that. It's getting a little bit more that way, and they feel like there are magnitudes of change. Everything is changing all the time really quickly. Most other industries have been that way for a very long time. So what looks like a massive change to somebody in healthcare is going to work every day in any other kind of, uh, in any kind of industry. Um, the other thing I wanted uh, you to think about is that in the course of this discussion, there are moral questions. And Notre Dame is a great place to think about moral questions. Is health care a right? Is health care a right in this country? And if it is, how do you fulfill that? Who pays and who's responsible? One of the big trends in health care is to make patients more responsible for their own care because the health care system can't afford to pay for everything that's wrong with everybody if they're unwilling to take responsibility for themselves. A lot of the things we're going to be talking about today raise real issues of who deserves health care, what kind of health care do they deserve, who pays for it, and who's responsible for it. So with that, oh, and the final thing is I would be flattered and relieved if you interrupted me with questions, seriously. I think it will be much more interesting for you. If you don't understand something, you've got a question you want to challenge, please Raise your hand. I would really appreciate it. So with that, let's get going. First of all, I'll talk about the status quo. Um, US health care costs are a killer, $3 billion, of which the government uh, piece is up almost 12%. Most things, mortgage rates don't go up like that. Gas, food, everything, these rates of increase are fairly, uh, are fairly significant. And government-funded health care is up a fair amount as well. Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is for people 65 and older. Medicaid is for people who are impoverished or disabled. So let's look at our spending versus other uh, developed countries. The United States spends on average $9,000 per year per person in the United States. But look at everybody else. We are light years ahead in terms of our total spending for every other country that we would consider that would have a comparable uh, economy to us. So we are spending, yeah, two and a, I can't do the math in my head, two and a half times what the median is. 
significantly more than other countries. So let's see what this gets for us. Um, first of all, for those of you who worry about uh, the, the light blue line is how much we're paying for health care, and this is a percent of GDP. So if you look relative to other countries, we spend a greater percent of GDP on health care itself, but less on social care. Social care are all those kinds of programs that are not health care per se, they're taking care of homeless people and foster care and all those other kinds of kind of social service things that swirl around uh, health care. But when you hear rhetoric that says, oh, Canada has a socialized system and it's a single payer system, we are spending, a, and it's expensive. If you look, Canada is only spending 20% of its GDP totally on health care, where the United States is spending 25%. So we are big spenders in this area. So let's look about what that money gets for us in terms of care. Because as you know in business, just because you spend more doesn't necessarily mean that the quality and the content of what comes out the other end is better. So more expensive is not always better. So in the United States, the life expectancy, 78.8 years. That is the shortest of every country on this, on this chart, shorter. Why is it shorter? Let us take a look at, look at infant mortality per live birth. We have the highest rate of infant mortality in this country. Infant mortality is defined as um, a child through the first year of their lives. So infant, infant deaths are often caused by people who put their kid in bed with them and roll over, people who don't have car seats, people don't feed their children properly, people who put all kinds of stuff in their crib so that their uh, uh, child runs into things with baby bumpers and things. We have the highest rate of infant mortality of all these other countries. The percent of the population of people 65 and over, that's the Medicare. So if you're looking 10 years down, the baby boomers, of which Jim and I are part, we are getting to the 65 and up. So you're going to see this huge switch, uh, shift in the population of people getting older and older and older. And you are going to pay for us. Keep that in mind. So the percentage of population with two or more chronic conditions, that could be diabetes or high cholesterol or heart failure or something, 68% um, of the people in the United States have two or more chronic conditions. That is the highest number of any of these other countries by a lot. I mean, these are all statistically significant. Then obesity rates. Guess what? We're the fattest country. 35.3% uh, of it is probably adults are overweight. And overweight causes all kinds of other bad things to happen. So when you know you have high blood, and I'm not a doctor, God help me, um, but all kinds of you have high blood pressure, cholesterol. Uh, you know it's hard on your liver, it's hard on your heart, all these kinds of things. So when we start talking about how do you cut the cost of health care and treat people differently, most people who are obese could take care of that themselves. Not everybody. But most people, the weight comes down, the chronic conditions go away. And then this one is on prescriptions. 2.2% uh, 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 of the average number of prescription drugs, uh, 18 and older. 2.2, again, we are, a, we are a more, I don't want to say more drug nation, because we are not. but. We are, we are liberal prescribers of uh, medication. A couple of interesting things about that. Um, the government has instituted a lot of measures to make uh, health care more consumer friendly, to really take a patient's uh, uh, needs and wants into consideration. One of the things they've decided is something called pain management. They've, the government has decided, they ask patients, did they help you manage your pain? The definition of managed pain is no pain at all. So let's say you broke your shoulder skiing. A top score on pain management would be that you have no pain at all with a broken shoulder. 
Um, what that means is more prescription drugs in order to get rid of that pain. And hospitals care about those scores because they are starting to get paid based on how well they score on these things. So that if you give people more prescriptions, this is a little bit of a generalization, and, but an example, the more you prescribe for people so that they can have less pain, the more you get paid because you have good patient satisfaction. So that's thing one. Thing two is that what we have found in Ohio, and I know we're, this isn't Ohio, but we're an adjacent state. I'm assuming it's not all that different. There are 80 opiates, pills, individual opiate pills, prescribed in Ohio for every man, woman, and child in the state. 80 pills. Think of that, opiates. What happens when you have that? If you have a high degree of opiates when you've got pain, and it's easy to get, and you have that rate of prescription, what happens is that you kind of get hooked on painkillers. A lot of people get hooked on painkillers. And painkillers, some kids take them out of their uh, uh, parents' uh, uh, cabinet because their parents have some left over, or they were prescribed because they had a knee injury or sports injury, and you kind of get hooked on opiates. What happens when you're hooked on opiates and you can't have further access to opiates? Heroin. The heroin epidemic is out of control because heroin is inexpensive. It is a better high than any prescription drug on the market. So they, these are some of the consequences for the activities of our healthcare system. Um, also, end of life care. Um, for those of you who have been with a parent or a grandparent in the end of their lives, when you look at the, uh, at the spending, um, Medicare, again, is for people over 65, 30% are attributed to the 5% of the beneficiaries who die every year, and the majority of that spending is in the last month of life. And this is a moral and ethical question for this country. Most people find it very difficult to withhold care from especially somebody that they love who is dying. They always feel like they need to extend life. It is a huge issue in the industry that we're not doing a good job of. But if I could give you one piece of advice, you should talk to your parents about what their preferences are, because I know how difficult it is if you don't know what their preferences are to have to make really, really tough decisions. And because people are unwilling to say, enough is enough, what they do is they try to do as much as they possibly can. It drives up costs, and I'm not so sure that the quality of life is all that good. Um, a lot of people are worried about the government takeover of health care. Let me tell you, it has already happened. The government, uh, Medicare, 41%, uh, Medicaid, over 50%, they are the largest and most powerful purchaser of health care services in the country. And as people get older, it's going to be even more so. They have enormous market power when they, uh, all the things that they're doing around quality and pricing and everything drives the rest of the market. So when you worry about government taking over, I can assure you it's already happened. It's just going to get worse. Self-pay means two different things. Self-pay in our hospital, which is a, a county hospital that pays for a lot of people who don't have enough money for health care, self-pay means no pay. It means it's a total write-off of a bad debt. At the Cleveland Clinic, Self-pay means very wealthy people who come to the Cleveland Clinic to have very exotic transplants or heart care, and they pay in cash. So self-pay can be somebody really personally wealthy who pays in cash or somebody who has no money at all. Um, so let's see, uh, from a profitability point of view, if over 50% of the dollars in the health care system are Medicare and Medicaid and the government is controlling this, if you look at the break-even line, most hospital systems lose money on 50% of their patients. 50%. What if you, you know, how can you lose? And, the, and these are not loss leaders, like in regular business. This is just the cost of caring for these people is less than the government reimburses. And that line up there, private payer, that means 
Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, things like that. Those private insurance agencies pay more than the government does, which is why many hospitals want and, and healthcare organizations want people with commercial insurance because they pay better than the government. Um, also, the issue of cost. I don't even <laughs> want to get in. It's complicated, and I believe that by complicating it, it has it is so not consumer friendly. This is a place where you're going to see radical changes. There's almost no transparency. If you want to have your nose fixed, for example, and you go online and you try to figure out how much that is going to cost, almost impossible. Almost impossible. So we have hospital charges. Just for being in a hospital, it costs you more. Uh, physician charges, facility fees. These, this is like a cell phone bill or a, an old cable bill. Remember when you got, you know, your cable is 90 bucks a month, and then you've got six or seven other charges added on to that, and then at the end it turns out to be double, and you say, where did that come from? Healthcare is a little bit like that, but they can do that legally. We have actual costs. Everybody gives discounts, negotiated prices, so you could have three different people get exactly the same procedure, and it would be charged and cost three different things. So it's, a, it's an industry that is complicated uh, much to its own uh, uh, disadvantage. So here's a typical thing for any of you. I'm hoping that you're covered by your parents still so you don't have to look at these bills. But for example, if somebody's going to have a joint replacement, the, the average hospital charge is $89,000. They charge the uh, insurance company. The insurance company will reimburse them $26,696 for a bill that they sent for $89,000 when their actual cost is about 15. And if you've ever looked at a healthcare bill, you've got all kinds of discounts and reimburse and all these kinds of things. It's hard to understand the bill. I think one of the things that's going to change is that there's going to be a lot of changes to this so that the bills are really straightforward. Um, Think of the typical patient experience. I don't know how many of you go for annual checkups, but this is kind of how it works. You can call, now you can go online to try to get an appointment. You usually have to wait at least two months, at least, depending, especially if you want to get an annual physical. You check in at your appointed time and you wait. You fill out a history questionnaire, which, oh, by the way, is in your electronic health record anyway, but you fill it out. Then you wait. You go to an exam room with a tech who takes your blood and your temperature and your weight and all that kind of stuff. And then you wait. And then the physician comes in and spends, on average, 12 minutes with you. And you don't really have time to discuss questions. And if you do have questions, you can tell that this person is in a hurry because they've got six more patients lined up down the hall. There's enormous pressure to do volume, volume, volume. So when you think about your traditional Marcus Welby kind of loving, you know me, you know my family, you know everything about me, I trust you, that is not the case. Hard to get in, a lot of waiting, very little time. So the thing that knows the most about your health is actually your health record. So let's say that you can't wait two weeks because you think you have strep throat, because that's what it takes to get in to see your regular doctor. You can, you can either wait to see your regular doctor, who probably doesn't know you anyway and will spend less than 12 minutes, or you've got a lot of options. This is a huge growth area in, in, uh, in care, because you can walk in. A lot of times they'll tell you what the wait is before you get there, but it's much more customer responsive. They do a narrow number of things. And depending on what's wrong with you, it's a lot easier to go to an express care um, and, and pick up a prescription and, and get out of there because you can do it right now. This is a society that values immediacy, particularly when you're sick. So this idea of waiting, 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 waiting is not is getting to be very outmoded, I would say. Also, telemedicine appointments. They're starting to do things. You can Skype with your doctor. You can text. You can talk to them on the phone. It's a lot easier in some practices because you don't necessarily, as medicine evolves, you don't necessarily have to physically be present to be diagnosed. So um, 
there are a lot of legal issues associated with essentially uh, doing this thing remotely and then prescribing after you've done it remotely. But this is a huge, huge trend, and somebody will figure it out, believe me. Um, we talk a little bit about physicians. In the good old days, uh, physicians um, used to make a lot of money, and they used to have spare time. Neither one of those is presently the case. Um, think of a physician. Four years in college, four years in medical school, a minimum of three years residency, and many of them go on to advanced education if you want to be an electrophysiologist, which is some exotic part of healthcare, of uh, heart, uh, cardiac care. Um, an average of $176,000 in debt. That's a lot of debt. You're in your late 20s, early 30s. That is an enormous amount of debt. And when you get to be a resident, I have a friend who's a fellow, a cardiac fellow at the Cleveland Clinic. She's had eight, nine years postgraduate work. She's earning $55,000 a year. That's tough. That's tough. Um, less future earnings power just due to the, due to the uh, pressure of regulations and reimbursement, mostly from the government. Limited opportunities for private practice. Private practice today, you need a ton of lawyers, you need a very expensive medical uh, record system, and the regulations and the reporting is a killer. And it tends to be more about running a complex little business than it is about healthcare. So most physicians have just said, I'd rather go work for a hospital system because they'll take care of that stuff for me. So private practice, uh, very unusual. Paperwork. About 25% of a physician's time is done on paperwork. Um, that's, and the patient care is limited. Very little time with patients, but with a lot of administration and cost and risk associated with it. There's a lot of pressure to see more patients. And uh, also, patients diagnose themselves. Doctors are used to being in charge and people coming in and listening to what they have to say. Now, somebody has been watching a Zarelto commercial. They've gone on the web, and they've read it on uh, WebMD, and they walk into a physician's office saying, I want drug X, not saying, this is what's wrong with me or what doesn't feel right. So it's very, on the one hand, an educated consumer is a good thing. It's basically a very good trend. But on the other hand, you spend the first half of your valued 12 minutes trying to figure out what's really plaguing the person and talking them out of the need for Xarelto, for example. So it is frustrating to physicians. And it's just, and they also have lots of patients who come and they have the same thing wrong and the same thing wrong. And did you cut down your cholesterol? Did you uh, exercise a little bit more? And they'll go, no, no, but I still don't feel well. Um, so, that's, so that's frustrating. This is the thing longer term that is incredibly worrisome. This chart shows um, half, less than half of the, how many of you would choose a career in medicine if you had to do it all over again? That's the blue line. How many of you would choose the same specialty? That's the red line. Look at family medicine, the third one up. This is your primary care physician, takes care uh, of kids and adults. Fewer than half of the people would go into family medicine again. That's why there is such a crisis um, in the availability of family care, because it's a ton of work, it's a lot of stress, it's a lot of schooling, and they earn maybe $150,000, $175,000 a year after all that education and all that debt and all that pressure. They don't get to spend a lot of time with their patients, and the pay is not that good. So there you go, health care reform. Um, the Affordable Care Act, we'll just call it Obama. We'll call it <laughs> Obamacare. Um, it did a lot of good things. If you had pre-existing conditions, uh, you're not allowed to be excluded. Um, your parents can carry you on their policy until you're 26, which is both of my kids did that, and that was great for me. Um, it also extended coverage to millions of Americans. This is not a perfect solution because there are a lot of people with health care insurance now that didn't have it before, which makes us feel good about being able to take care of people in our society. However, a lot of these people who got extended care under the Affordable Care Act, 
there's how much do you pay for the insurance, or you got expanded Medicaid, but a lot of these people can't afford the co-pays. To go to a doctor and have to pay $20 or $30 for a copay, to a lot of people, that's a lot of money. To go to an emergency room, $75. High deductible plans, and you'll probably run into this, that you have to pay the first $5,000 of your medical expenses before your insurance uh, kicks in. If you have to pay the first $5,000 guaranteed, short of being in an auto accident, you are not going to seek out care. $5,000 is a huge amount. So even though people have coverage, they don't necessarily use it because it still costs money. We have people who come to our hospital who can't afford to pay parking or who have to take three buses and they've got four kids and it's just the hassle and cost factor is huge on these things. Um, but you get more people with insurance but they can't necessarily afford, you know, you go in and these people, even if they, uh, they actually show up at their appointment and they have their appointment and the doctor says you need prescription X and you need to take it for the next three months, $20 copay every time. So this, so the, so the ancillary costs of healthcare add up and up. So you feel good, I hope, about having more people with health insurance who just don't wait to get so sick they show up in the emergency room, but there are other costs that are keeping people from using uh, the system. The best thing about health care reform is that the government is actively, actively pushing costs down and quality up. So for those of you who think that government's involvement in health care is a bad thing, it's always a mixed thing, but they are doing a couple of things that are incredibly important. Also, you've got more choices. So uh, hospital systems need to be more competitive. You have more people who are insured. And if you didn't have any insurance, you need to go to a hospital like ours because we take people who can't pay. But all of a sudden, you have some, some, uh, some insurance. You can go almost anywhere. So it's making the industry more competitive, which I think is uh, 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 good. So um, when we talk about affordable care, it's about people delay. They're still delaying getting care, or they're not getting care at all because it's way too expensive. There are a couple of big insurers who have offered uh, health care insurance through the, uh, through the exchanges. But those are people who tended to be that you couldn't get insurance before because you had chronic conditions or something. They're losing money on all of these people. So one way or another, Obamacare is going to need to get reformed. But how that happens, we don't know. The other big shift, and this is just a hospital perspective, but I'm sure you've noticed it in the old days, most things that you had to have done in the healthcare system, you actually checked in as a patient and stayed a couple of days. That is really, really expensive care. Now you can go in in the morning and they switch out your knee or they do whatever, and you can go home. That's much cheaper for the healthcare system. It is also people are much better off recovering at home than in a hospital, because hospitals have lots of infections, among other things. And besides, it's not that much fun. And they don't let you sleep. They're always waking you up. So it's better to go home and have care. Hospitals earn a lot less money if it's done in an outpatient setting. So this big move from being in a hospital to being in a clinic someplace is better care for the patient and cheaper, but less money for the hospital. Um, this is an important move more if you're interested in healthcare as a business as opposed to a patient, because I'm not entirely sure you can see this as a patient. The way stuff works right now, uh, let's say you're the Cleveland Clinic, and you do extraordinarily complex things. You get paid. Let's say you do a triple bypass on somebody. The insurance company will pay you for that triple bypass. And then, then if that person has an infection, that costs more. The insurance company will pay to have the, the infection fixed. If it didn't work and you have to go back to the hospital, you get paid again. So actually, there's in some cases, there's a, a reverse effect because the more procedures you do and the more complications and the more readmissions to the hospital, the more money you make because you get paid on a piecemeal basis. What people are moving towards is something called value-based care, which is you don't get paid based on, you know, Joe Blow had his, his knee done. 
Um, it is the entirety of the care. How much did that cost? And if you have too many readmissions or too many infections, you get reimbursed less. There are penalties for the kinds of things that used to drive up, that people used to be incentive. They didn't do it on purpose, but there was an incentive to do more and more procedures. Now the incentive in value-based care is to keep people healthier. You do it once, you do it right, you get them out of the hospital, you get them the right care post-hospital that is better for the person and cheaper for the payer. That is a huge, huge um, uh, trend. And the drivers are two things, the rising cost of medical care and the lack of predictable quality. A lot of quality things you can't see, but how many people do you know who've gone into the hospital and got sick with something else while they were there? Happens particularly with elderly people. It's almost more dangerous sometimes to be in a hospital than not. So there are a lot of things about how an HAI is a, a hospital-acquired infection. So the government is putting a lot of pressure to reduce those infections so that we get you out faster, cheaper, better. Now, accountable care organizations, this is way in the weeds. Only people who love healthcare are going to want this. But um, this is a new way of treating people in that you, uh, um, you have a lot more coordination of care. Right now, you tend to think that your caregiver is your physician. Now you've got a whole team of people, all of whom are not necessarily MDs, because every piece of your care does not require somebody with an MD education. A lot of times, a nurse is not only just as good, sometimes they're better, because they're better listeners and better communicators, generally, than physicians. Um, but anyway, um, they've developed a lot of quality measures. So they're looking at these organizations who say, we're going to take care of this group of people. And if your quality measures are good and your outcomes are good, you're going to get paid more than if they were bad. So this is a huge financial incentive for organizations. And uh, they've been around for a while, but they're getting more and more and more powerful. You might not even notice this but it's going to make a difference ultimately. Um, also, population health strategies. This is a variation, but this is saying if you take a group, and this is the way that a hospital would look at it. I don't know that you would even notice this, but it's an attempt, again, you, you have a population, let's say 100 people. And in any population of 100 people, you have 10% of them who are really sick and have a ton of stuff wrong with them. There's a middle level of people who could conceivably get sick soon, and then you have a whole bunch of people at the bottom who are healthy. We call them the walking well. Wonderful group of people. But what this does is says that we worry about the, uh, the population health as a whole. So what you do is you focus most of your activity on keeping that 10% healthy. Secondary focus on the next level of people who can you prevent them from getting, you know, having heart attacks, for example, or can you prevent strokes, or can you do something so that they don't get adult onset diabetes, for example. But this is a whole different way. You don't look at patients one by one by one. You group them by how sick they are and what kind of care they need, and that's the way that you think about them. So what this does is it allows you to manage chronic diseases better, and it's a whole, it's a coordinated approach, because you just don't, if you have three or four things wrong with you, you gotta, you gotta manage them together not separately, because they all have impacts on each other. Um, they're also, this is where you get a lot of these wellness, uh, a lot of these wellness programs, because the idea is you, you know, from a moral point of view, you have more people who stay healthier longer. That's the societal benefit, but also there is an increasing financial uh, motivation to keep more people healthier longer, because you, the more the cost to the government goes down in terms of of paying for the health care of these people, you get sometimes you get to share in the savings. Like if you kept somebody healthy for 100 bucks and the budget was 200, you can split it with the government. They get 50 and they get they you split the savings. It is a huge uh, thing. There's also cool stuff 
Um, to a certain extent, technology are a little bit like shiny objects. Um, but a lot of the stuff, what it's going to do is it's going to allow people to take more responsibility for their health. And it's also going to allow a lot more remote, remote uh, work so that you don't physically have to go to a doctor's office every time you get sick. So what this says is it saves you time, it saves both parties money, and it also helps keep data on you so that you really know what's going on and it's a uh, better uh, uh, diagnosis. At the Cleveland Clinic, you can have a virtual visit for 50 bucks. So instead of getting in your car, driving to the Cleveland Clinic, find, in this massive hospital of 27 buildings, finding the doctor's office, waiting, you can schedule an online appointment. You can have a virtual visit. And for many of those, you can uh, prescribe medication if that's called for. Think how easy that is for the physician. Think how low the cost is for you and for the system because they don't have to pay for as many buildings. They're not wasting a lot of people's time waiting and transporting. So this is a huge trend. There's also something called the Health Spot Telemedicine Kiosk. They recently declared, yes, sir. Um, so I, I was curious if you have a thought or if there's anything going on how you get these telehealth options and other kind of out of office techniques into the hands of people that need them most. So the, the people on Medicare and Medicaid that are either older or don't have, might not have the means for these, this type of equipment so that hospitals can still see people that not help them be profitable but help them we're trying out all kinds of stuff like that. Um, sometimes it works, but we are doing a lot of experiments, particularly older people. Um, a lot of them have cell phones, and they're quite agile at using their cell phones. So your cell phone can be programmed, for example, to remind you to take your medication. And the nurse can call you up and say, I noticed that you know, you're not taking your medication. Is there something we can do to help? That is a whole lot cheaper than having that person. So we're trying out a lot of things. It's partially age dependent. Um, obviously, people your age are a lot more comfortable uh, using technology, and everything doesn't have to be in person. But we're, we're uh, experimenting. The other thing, which is a complicating factor, which can be overcome is personal health information. We're going to talk about cybersecurity in a minute. Personal health information, you do not want anybody stealing your health information. You do not. You, and hospitals have very strict rules about the consequences of inadvertently or on purpose uh, releasing uh, uh, health information. Anytime you have a mobile device, even a phone, just think how many things get hacked, right? Everybody gets hacked. What if your personal health information gets hacked? So any of these remote devices that you use for, pres for prescribing uh, or for diagnosing uh, opens people up to the theft of their personal health information. Personal health information is very valuable. And also, it's personal. I frankly don't want anybody else to know what my health status is. Nobody. It's none of anybody's business. So you've got those kinds of issues to work out. Does that answer your question? So in the shiny uh, object category, there's something called a health spot telemedicine kiosk. So this thing that looks like a, a Woody Allen egg, um, you know, from the movie. What was the movie? Sleeper. Thank you. From Sleeper, it's this egg. Um, and they put it in public places. And you're supposed to go in there and dial up the doctor and say, I have this rash. On, and there's a screen there so you can see the doctor. You're supposed to say, I have this rash, and open up your shirt. Um, and we tried some of these in Cleveland because it's a very cost-effective, kind of low, uh, uh, low maintenance way to do it because you don't have to go to the doctor's office and wait. You can just go into one of these kiosks. And convenience has a huge factor. These people went out of business. They recently declared bankruptcy. So I think if you're looking into the venture capital side of this thing, probably 50% of the great new shiny object ideas are going to fail. But the other 50% are going to be absolutely transformative. So this is one that uh, is bankrupt. They won't, be the, uh, they won't be the last. The other thing is there's a lot of talk about patient-centered care. Um, this is a, a, a concept that would be foreign to any other business, because most businesses are extremely consumer-centric. 
not so much in, uh, in health care, but one of the uh, things that, again, the government has encouraged are doctor reviews. You can go on healthgrades.com, look up the doctor, and they have all kinds of comments and factual information about the quality of this physician. And if you think about the way that people usually find a doctor, they ask a friend of theirs, you know, who's your primary care doctor? Oh, Dr. Susie May, she's wonderful, I really love her, so you go to Susie May. That is not a fact-based clinical choice. That is a personal referral, which are extremely powerful. Here, you can go on this website and actually get information. If you're thinking about, if you need your knee, I know knee replacement is not, if your knee was busted up in a skiing accident and you were looking for a physician who was gonna fix your ACL, for example, you can see how many procedures, how many procedures that physician had done on that particular thing because the more procedures you do, the better you get. You can look at their quality scores. You can look at um, comments that people made about what is, their, uh, what is their interpersonal style. Some people like warm doctors and some people don't care. They just want to get taken care of and get out. But this gives you information that has really never been available before and it is very, very powerful. Um, what patients want these days. Everybody wants to get better because nobody wants to get sick. Putting that aside, if you would ask a healthcare person, they would say, what patients really want is a great doctor. Here's what patients actually say they want. Consumer-centered hours. That means doctors usually work nine to five, right? How many, Monday through Friday. How many of you find it convenient, especially when you have full-time jobs, to go to the doctor nine to five and wait? So they want more flexible hours, conveniently located. That's why you're gonna see increasingly, I was just in Dallas, Texas last weekend, there are little boutique, and it's not only primary care, you can get all kinds of cosmetic surgery and plastic surgery, all kinds of you know bone, bone and joint replacement in strip shopping centers. So there, is, so there is increasing access in the physical access sense and in the sense that you can go online, you can Skype, you can do this, you can do that. So they just, they want convenience, widespread avail, and on demand. If you're sick, if you have to take a test in two days and you've got a wicked case of the flu, you wanna be able to find uh, somebody who can, who can fix you up right now. You don't want to wait. You don't have the time to wait, and your and your life is too urgent to sit around and wait. So, besides, you're miserable in the process, and who wants to be miserable? Um, there's also a a myth would be a little bit strong, but there's a belief that the most important thing to patient loyalty has to do with their personal relationship with their physician. This is changing dramatically. So, if we look at ten years out. What, what drives loyalty? If your physician only sees you 12 minutes a year and in order to figure out who you are, he has to look at your electronic health record, um, does that inspire loyalty? Mm, probably not. What does inspire loyalty? Convenience is the top factor. Think if you went to school for, med you, you went to medical school for 10 years and it turns out that your patient is driven by convenience for peace sake, it's a little, it's disheartening to physicians, but when you're looking for primary care, which is different than a specialist, convenience is the top factor. If you have to wait too long, people are willing to switch physicians. There's also kind of a myth in the business that people don't want to switch physicians because they have this trusting relationship. That is sometimes the case, and that's a good thing, but, and they, they think patients expect to wait because they understand that things happen. Um, actually, patients do not expect that things happen, and increasingly they are expecting not to wait because they value their time. Everybody has busy lives. Everybody has conflicts on how they're going to spend their time. So they're willing to switch if the wait is too long. It is easier to switch a physician than it is to switch a bank. I used to work for a bank. Getting a checking account or a mortgage at a new bank it, will it is an incredibly detailed process. 
Switching your doctor is a piece of cake. Getting an appointment might be difficult, but you can switch the doctor. Um, and determining where to seek care, it's again, it's access, access, access. Access and convenience, not clinical quality. Huge trend. It's going to accelerate. Uh, also, there are a lot of disruptive innovators. Uh, healthcare has been kind of immune to a lot of the competitive forces that, that partially because it is complicated, and secondly, because they overcomplicate it to keep the dogs at bay, I think. Um, there are a lot of stuff going on in the market that are massive disruptors. And let me talk about, for example, a flu shot. You used to have to go to your physician's office to get a flu shot. You can almost get a flu shot at a gasoline station. Not exactly, but you can get one at Target. You can get one at Walgreens. You can get one at CVS. Walgreens and Target are getting into the primary care business. For any of you who have been into a, uh, I'm sorry, Walmart. If you go into a Walmart, they've got all kinds of stuff, but they also have uh, eye doctors. They're going to get in the primary care business. Um, because if you're looking to have easy access, and a, a lot of people go through a Walmart, um, it's inexpensive, it's fast, and it's convenient. So think about all the different places that you could get it. So if you're cost conscious, Walmart is a good choice. Plus, they're going to post their, their prices, so you're going to know how much uh, you're going to pay. There's also another group. One medical group, Q Lions, those are uh, concierge medical practices, which is quite uh, different. But the point is that all of these things that are going on, maybe half of them are going to work and half of them won't. They're just in their infancy stages, but this is going to be huge. How many of you, let's say that when you get out of the Mendoza College of, of, of Business, and you have a job with a consulting firm, and your hourly billing rate is 200 bucks an hour. That doesn't mean that what's you, that's what your firm charges your client. That's not what you get, but your billing rate is 200 to $300 uh, dollars an hour. And you get a cold, and you need to go to the doctor, and it's going to take you three hours door to door. What is the value of no waiting? to you. How much would you be willing to pay not to ever have to wait for primary care? Um, and that's what concierge health care is. Again, a small industry starting up, but what you do is you pay a certain amount of money a year depending on the level of service, but for somebody like you, 300 bucks a year, which is less money than I'm suspecting that you spend on coffee and beer and something else, whatever. But $300 a year is not very much money. Um, what if same day appointments, no waiting? No question. Or you could do it electronically. Would, if you build at two or $300 an hour, would you be willing to pay $300 a year to make sure that you never wasted time waiting for the doctor. That's what this business at its very basis is all about. Huge. I would invest in this if I had any money. Um, I've been talking for a long time and only got one question. Anybody out there at all? A question? Before I talk about the social determinants of health, you'll think I'm a social worker. Yes, sir. You talked about the change in customer preference that hospitals are having to deliver um, service across a wider area. So being from Cleveland, I guess the easy example for you to relate to is the whole east side, there's Cleveland clinics and university hospitals seemingly in every other town. As that expansion happens and, and the hospitals are expanding you know, beyond the main location, what's that doing to the cost structure that you talked about at the beginning of your presentation? Is it helping getting more people seen and, and creating more volume, or is it making it more difficult and making it more difficult to sustain a hospital? It, generally speaking, it's um, when you're talking about an expansion to make access easier, that's usually access to doctor visits. It's usually not inpatient, I'm going to have surgery kind of things. Um, so in order to build 
a doctor's office. It's a lot cheaper to build it in a strip shopping center than it is to build it on the campus of the Cleveland Clinic. The costs just go through the roof for a whole variety of reasons. So for basic services and also for what we call outpatient surgery, which is you go in in the morning, you have your surgery, you're home by the afternoon, those things are in a highly distributed network. And it's easier for people to get to, it's easier for them to park, and the costs to the hospital system are less because the building that they are in is a lower acuity building. So uh, they're not necessarily, you know, so the old days when you went to the big mother hospital and there wasn't anything else, those are pretty much gone. People are, uh, people are adjusting to that change, but I think you're going to see more and more and more of that. Plus, if you can get basic health care um, at a drugstore or at a Target um, or at a Walmart, the, all the competitive dynamics change. So just think if you were in a protected industry and all of a sudden we realize we're competing against Walmart and talk about a low cost structure to deliver primary care from a Walmart and de delivering primary care from a big hospital system, same care, radically different cost base. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, yes, sir. I have a question. You talked about the shift towards convenience and customer satisfaction and transparency. And earlier you talked about the uh, availability and demand for opioids. I think there's an even bigger problem. Yes, I did. Which is uh, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And what are the experts saying about how that new model might just become responsive to moving through and getting what they ask for? And how do we slow the one curve? That is a huge issue that people have actually been dealing with for a while because they're very concerned that if you, and I'm not a medical person, so don't take this for what it's worth. Um, there are a lot of viruses that get resistant if you take too many antibiotics. And if you take too many opioids, then your body chemistry is just kind of messed up. So we've even had discussions about, and there have been discussions in the state of Ohio about um, walking away from that pain management thing. Um, even though if somebody's in too much pain, then they can't heal. But if they have no pain whatsoever, then you get kind of hooked. So th they're trying to balance it, and consumers are much more demanding these days. They want to feel better right now. And they don't want to mess, or, you know, they don't want to go to rehab. if. if or or do something else. So I don't know that that's answered your question. It's a it's a cost question. It's a health question, and it's also a moral question. If by doing one thing to help them here, are we creating another problem farther down the road? It's a it's a huge issue. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure that I, I agree. did. It's a huge issue. The answer. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of people thinking about it, but um, it's, it would be such a significant shift that uh, it takes a while for these things to work themselves out. Um, to, to make people, sh particularly in healthcare, in some businesses you can just take a risk and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. In healthcare, if you change how you practice medicine or you change things like that, and it doesn't work out well, the consequences are significant. Um, and so you don't want to move so quickly that you inadvertently put people at risk. Yes, sir? Yeah, uh, you mentioned a couple of times uh, around the transparency uh, regarding cost and price being really um, transformative shift that's going on in the industry. I'm just curious, as a communications professional, um, how, some of, how you and some of your colleagues in that, that skill set I would say that um, we are a big part of that greater transparency. Um, and we are going to start to introduce things on our website that make doctor evaluations much easier. So instead of fighting it, we're going to embrace it because we think from a competitive point of view, it's important. Also, our hospital believes very strongly in improving the health of the community. So with uh, 
withholding key information from people who need it and deserve it is just, uh, it goes against our values. There is some amount of pushback. Um, the government, the government is a tough grader. They are, they are a tough grader. Um, I don't think that the public, there's a lot of information out there already about hospital quality. Um, most people don't access it that much, but it's there. If you want to know, it's there. Do you think it's a matter of withholding information versus giving it out? Um, ask me the question again. Is it, about, is it a matter of withholding information versus sharing it, or is it a matter of, or a matter of finding ways to communicate and sort of untangling all the different inputs into cost and pricing and then finding ways to share that? Um, I would like to say that we could do that right away, and, and philosophically, we should. Um, that is a long haul because that would require that we have a price list and that we could, but when you have the price list, it depends on who the payer is. The insurance company will pay X, an individual who's going to pay cash will pay Y. So it's because the industry has made itself so complicated, you can have transparency, but you don't necessarily have greater understanding. Also in healthcare, we're talking about withholding information. I think that there's a lot more we can do in communications. We're trying to work with doctors and nurses um, to use language that people understand um, because a lot of times they're talking here and the patient is there. And I have conversations with people, I really don't know what they're saying to me. Somebody said to me the other day, go to the postpartum floor. I don't know what postpartum is. It's after you've had the baby. It's the mothers and babies uh, floor. It's not so. There are words, and sometimes uh, we obscure meaning by explaining things in ways that are just not easily understood by other people. Also, uh, I read in the paper the other day that the Obama administration is going to make a rule that if you request your health record. Your hospital has to, your doctor has to give it to you in 30 days. 30 days. So if I take 30 days to get you your health record, is that withholding information? Is it obscuring information? Or is that transparency? I would argue that it's your health record, not the hospital's health record. It's yours. So why shouldn't they give it to you right away? Um, and there are lots of reasons for that, but the speed at which and the difficulty of getting to info, it's not that it's not there. It's the difficulty of finding it that is more the issue, I think. So we need to make it easier for people to get information that's relevant, written in a way that they understand and is still accurate. And that might sound easy, but it's actually not. It is not. Yes, sir? Yeah, you sort of alluded to uh, your dialogue with Dylan here. You know, you're new to the healthcare industry. You, you came from a different industry. I'm, I'm curious how you built your knowledge base up, uh, and scaled up. Of what, it seems to be a very technical industry. As you alluded to, it has its own jargon, its own technical terms. I imagine that's probably a complexity you deal with the position. I was wondering if you could just speak to wrapping your head around the industry and making sure that you're next with it. Well, you have to learn to be a good listener. Um, and then you also have to remember, uh, what I try to remember is that, first of all, I'm really, there's certain people who you work with who are willing to explain things to you. So I found a couple of, the chief nursing officer, I always go to her office afterwards and say, what were you guys talking about? I have no idea. Um, so you get people to explain it to you. But um, so there's partly that. But the trick in the communications business, and I also run government relations, so and we're a county hospital, which means that we are depending on the support of the county in order to operate. One of the major things that we do is to translate what goes on in our organization so that uh, reasonably well-educated, well-thinking people can understand it. So I almost see my job as more of a translator, which gives me the opportunity to say, 
what does this really mean? Or why would somebody care about this? Or how would you explain it? Because in Cleveland, um, it's not, I don't want to say we have many fine universities, but the average uh, reading uh, grade of the average Clevelander's fifth grade. So if you've got a fifth grade le reading level, so it's my job to, to make sure, because in order to keep those people healthy and to be responsible, they have to understand what people are saying to them. So we have to write for fifth grade. So I'm not embarrassed to admit that I don't understand something. Um, and I'm also not embarrassed to admit that I look at things differently. For example, this is a public health system. So it's a government organization. And I don't want to say that we don't care about profitability, but I've worked for publicly traded companies where your performance and doing what you're going to say you're going to do every quarter is critical to your uh, reputation. People will not invest with you. They will not do business with you if you can't run your own business properly and if you don't keep your commitments, right? So I think about that. There's not a lot of um, attention paid to that. You missed your budget, it's okay. You know, our, we're off a little bit this year. Do you know why? We had a light flu season. We make a lot of money off the flu. Not very many people got the flu this year, which is good for public health, but it stinks for our bottom line. So it's um, the, 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 discipl the disciplines of the market are not yet present in healthcare. So I bring the disciplines, and people say you're worrying about the wrong thing. I'm not worrying about the wrong thing. I'm just worrying about something different than they are. And I remind them that we're supposed to be embracing diversity. So anyway, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, probably it's due to like the pressure from governmental policy, like Medicare, Medicare, also from the change in demands of the customers, or like from the development in technology field. But what would be the major difficulties to this trend of um, cost reduction, and who will like fight back to these cost reducing activities? Um, most people fight change, um, and if you. It is such a different approach. If you got paid for every time you made a basket in basketball, and all of a sudden you only got paid on whether or not your team won, how you would operate, think, how you would charge, how you would engage with people is significantly different. And those changes come really slowly. So I was part of our new, uh, our part of our strategic plan. We are moving 100% to population health, which means unlike the Cleveland Clinic, which is still going to want to get paid for transplants and strokes and knee replacements, and, and they're still going to get paid uh, by procedure. We are deciding to move to getting paid by how well we keep somebody. So it is probably will take us five to 10 years. And there are very few examples in this country of people who have done it, much less done it well. So this is, this is new territory. It's going to impact how physicians get paid. Physicians get paid now by how many patients they see and what kind of procedures they get and doing things like that. What if you're not paid by the number of procedures you do or by the number of patients you saw but how healthy you kept somebody. Whole different concept. It, I believe it is the right concept. It's just a massive, massive switch. Anybody else? OK. Um, we've got five minutes. Yes, ma'am. You're going to get me out of talking about the social determinants of health, which is great. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. So I have a question because you mentioned there's like a great discrepancy between the understanding of uh, uh, of medical information, how you manage your body between like the doctor size and also the customer size. So do you think it's important that the government or in public schools they have like early education in this kind of health management or understanding of medical care like in general, like from early age, do you think that will help reduce the misunderstandings bef uh, between different parties? 
I think it would be helpful, but, um, and we already operate in schools. It's not so much about health education, it's about making sure that a kid gets his asthma medicine every day at the right time and that they can go see the doctor in the school as opposed to their parent having to take off from work, come get them, go back. Um, education is a huge issue. What I was going to say on the social determinants of health is whether or not you're healthy has 80% 80, 80 to do with social determinants and kind of 20% about everything else. So there are such strong social norms in certain groups, of, in, in every group of people, but there are such strong social norms. And if the people who determine your social norms um, are not well educated about health and don't, and haven't had much intersection with the, the health community, you can start in the elementary schools. But if there isn't any kind of reinforcement at home whatsoever or in the broader community in which they operate, it's, not, it's probably not liable to have a big impact. We are starting a, uh, a school at Metro Health where we're going to take kids out of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and uh, uh, run essentially a high school, a technical high school, for kids who want to go into technical fields. So there are lots of things that we're doing, but health literacy, which is on here someplace, is a huge huge issue. There are people who don't know, and then there are people who think they know, but they don't know. So um, just like anything else, education always helps, but I think it's a, it's a long go. Elizabeth? Yeah. If your physicians and if the system itself will be compensated for keeping people healthy, yes. what's the incentive to see really sick people? People who are sick because they're poor or sick because uh, they're uneducated, uh, or they got a bad gene pool, right? Which is always possible, yes, yeah. yes. So wouldn't, wouldn't the incentive be to turn those folks away to someone else, just push them out the door? If it was only about the money, then there is an incentive, and there is a certain amount of trying to shift certain patients from one place to the other. However, most people who went to medical school at their core, some people went to get really wealthy. Most people went because they want to help people and they are distressed about what's happening to their industry because they don't really feel the connection with the patient and they don't feel like they're helping. So to take somebody who is chronically ill and have the opportunity to really transform their life their lives because you can help uh, with that chronic illness, it can really change somebody's life. And there is nothing more rewarding or more powerful. And I work for a hospital where we mostly care for people who don't have enough money to pay. So anybody who works here, our clinical quality is as good as the Cleveland Clinic's. But we have a very special group of people who want to help, who don't want money to make a difference in whether or not people are healthy. And that is a very powerful moral imperative that I have never seen any place else in my life. It is unbelievable. But there is still, you get a, it's like a, a member of our department just had a baby the other day. You get a thrill. You, you deliver a healthy baby, it's a thrill. Really being able to fix somebody with problems is, is very rewarding. Okay. Only any more. Now it's growing quiet. I know. I suspect. Lunchtime. Uh, Elizabeth Allen, on behalf of the faculty and